Professor Murugan, and then maybe you take over. Shall we wait or shall we start? No, no, we start. Acha, okay. Yeah. So, welcome back to the Arichandra series uh, of lectures on Lee groups and Lee algebras. In the uh, chapter uh, Compact Lee groups, today we are having the second lecture, and uh, Dr. Munar Naik will be continuing on Peter theorem. I invite him to uh, give the lecture. We already lost five minutes. Perhaps we will go up to five past four. Thank you. Please, Muna. Thank you, sir. Or shall we? Uh, so I have learned Peter theory from Professor Mugurandam. He is my he is my teacher. So I am almost presenting the same thing which he has taught us. Okay. So. Recall in the previous uh, lecture, actually, we were trying to prove this theorem that uh, pi comma s and rho comma k be two irreducible unitary representation of G. If pi is not equivalent to rho, then inner product of pi e comma b and rho w comma z is equal to zero. And uh, second thing is we were, we were um, there is a second part of this theorem d pi dimension of which pi is finite. And inner product of pi u comma v comma inner product pi w comma z is nothing but one by d pi bar of inner product of u and w and uh, inner product of v and z. Okay, now what? Oh, okay, so we are on the way to really proving something. Uh, we have already proved the a. And we are on the way to prove B. Actually, I should mention one thing. Today also, I will take 10 minutes extra so, so that I can complete what a, the full Pitorial theorem. So, <clears throat> so in the previous lecture, so we have we are on the way to prove B and we have proved something. So we have proved this much. We have proved that inner product of pi u comma b comma pi w comma z is something C times inner bar of uh, inner product of UW and inner, into inner product of V and J. This much we have put. So I am writing this thing. So pi U comma V in inner product pi W comma Z is C bar of inner product of U and W and into inner product of V and J. Let U comma V be so that norm of U is equal to one and norm of V is equal to one. In, so, Putting W is equal to U and Z is equal to V in A above, we get this thing. Uh, if I will put this W is equal to U and Z is equal to V in A, so I will get that L2 norm of, uh, okay, what I will get? Pi UV norm square is equal to this constant C. Okay. So, and that will happen for any U comma V in H with norm U is equal to norm is equal to 1. Okay. So I am getting pi u comma v norm square is equal to c for any u comma v in of h with norm u is equal to norm v equal to 1. Now I put u is equal to v is equal to eta in b, okay, where eta is a fixed uh, vector in of a so that norm eta is equal to 1. Okay, so that means that from this thing I will get c is equal to really pi eta comma eta norm square and this function, okay. This is a non-zero function in L to G. I have explained that in the previous lecture. So this the norm square is strictly greater than zero. So I am getting C is greater than zero. So I have two information in my hand. First thing is, first information is pi u comma v norm square is equal to C for any uh, u with uh, and v with norm u is equal to norm v is equal to one. And second information is this constant C is really greater than zero. Okay. Now let us uh, prove first that dimension of H is infinite. The dimension of H is finite. Suppose dimension of H is finite. Let B is equal to U J J belongs to I be an orthonormal basis of H. Okay. So this B may be uncountable. So index set A can be uncountable. Okay. So I choose a countable subset, subset S of B. So let S is equal to E I so that I belong to a B a countable subset of B. Okay. Okay. So I am assuming dimension of H is infinity. Okay. I am taking a orthonormal basis 
B of H, okay, that may be uncountable also, but I am taking a countable subset of B. So observe that for each n belongs to n, I will get one is equal to no integration over G norm of U1 square DG. Here G is the higher measure, DG is the higher measure of G. And since norm of U1 square is equal to one and higher measure of G is normalized. So one is equal to integration of the norm of U1 square DG. Now norm of U1 square is same thing as norm of pi G U1 square because pi G is unitary now, okay? So this is equal to integration over G norm of pi G U1 square. Now look at this uh, quantity, norm of pi G U1 square. Okay? So by a practical theorem, this is this quantity, norm of pi G U1 square is shut only greater than, greater than equal to summation i is equal to 1 to n or inner product of pi g e1 comma e i square dz. Okay, this follows from partial theorem. And hence, if you integrate over g, that equal, inequality will still be written. So I will get integration over g, norm of pi g e1 square dz is greater than equal to integration over g, uh, summation i is equal to 1 to n, the mod of pi g mod of inner product of pi g1 comma pi mod square dz okay now this thing is this quantity this is nothing but the matrix coefficient so this is i write that this will this is equal to integration over g summation i is equal to 1 to n mod of pi ei comma e1 g mod square dz now i take the integration outside uh, so i take the sum outside of the integration so this is equal to summation i is equal to 1 to n integration over g mod of pi e i comma e1 g square d z. Okay. Now this is summation i is equal to 1 to n. This is nothing but pi e j comma e1 uh, norm square. Okay. So okay. So I am getting summation i is equal to 1 to n norm of pi e j comma e1 square. This uh, look at this quantity carefully. So this quantity is if you look at v. This quantity is always C because this happens for any U command. So this quantity is C. So I, I will write that C. So summation I is equal to 1 to N C. So this is N C. Okay. So what I am getting, I am getting N1 greater than equal to N C for each N. So that is important. So hence, thus hence for each N block to N, we get this thing 1 greater than equal to N C. Thus we get 0 less than c less than equal to 1 by n for every n okay since c is a positive quantity this happens for every n and this is a contradiction so hence i am getting this dimension of it is very fine now i have to really prove that c is equal to uh, d pi what is d pi d pi is the really dimension of h okay okay now, if I can prove this C, if I will prove C is equal to 1 by D pi from this equation, from A, I will, uh, so I will put here C is equal to 1 by D pi and the result will follow. The sure orthogonality result will follow. So I am planning to prove that. So let E1, E2, E D pi be an orthogonal basis for H. Now, 1 is equal to integration over G, norm of U1 square DG. This is equal to integration over G norm of pi g1 square dg. I explained this in the paper because pi g is Now by personal thing theorem, this norm of pi g1 square is nothing but j summation j is equal to 1 to d pi mod of uh, inner product of pi g1 comma e j square dg. And uh, this is called the integration over g summation j is equal to 1 to d pi. This is, this is nothing but uh, mod of pi e j comma e1 g square dc now i write that line so this is equal to j is equal to one summation j is equal to one to d pi integration over g mod of pi is a u r g square dc and this is equal to nothing but summation j is equal to one to d pi norm of pi is a u one square and this is really c okay i have told you that this is always c this is this is the line okay so this is c so, so j is equal to 1 to d pi c. Since I am uh, coming d pi 10, so d, I will get d pi c. So, I am getting what? I am getting 1 is equal to d pi c. 
So I will get C is equal to one by D pi. Okay. Then from A, it follows that inner product of pi u comma v comma pi w comma z is equal to one by two d pi inner product of bar of inner product of u w and v u. So this is I am putting just C is equal to one by d pi in A. So this finishes the proof of uh, that theorem. Okay. Okay. Now I we define a new concept called character. Let pi comma a be a finite dimensional unitary representation of g. So F D is the acronym for finite dimensional representation. Finite dimensional. Okay. F D stands for finite dimensional. So we define chi pi as a function from g to c by chi pi g is nothing but trace of pi g. Okay. The function chi pi is called the character of pi. Okay. So let u one comma e two comma e n be an orthonormal basis for S. Where n is equal to dimension of h, since chi pi z is nothing but summation i is equal to one to n, inner product of pi z e i comma e i, and you know that d going sorry g going to pi z is continuous function. So therefore, it follows that chi pi is a continuous function on g. Okay. So okay. So chi pi is a continuous function on g, and there is a simple observation. Observation is if pi s is equivalent to rho comma k, and the dimension of h and dimension of k is finite, then chi pi is equal to chi rho. Okay, so this says that if pi and rho are equivalent, then character of pi is same as character of rho. This follows from the fact that this is really conjugation in there. It can be proved easily using this fact that this is conjugation in there. Now I do a little discussion. Let home G, home G is the collection of all continuous group homomorphisms from G to S one. So home G is the set of all mappings from G to S one, so that pi is a continuous group homomorphism. Okay, home stands for homomorphism. Okay, let pi comma S be an unitary representation of G such that d pi is equal to dimension of H is equal to one. Okay, now as dimension of H is equal to one, therefore pi is certainly irreducible. Okay, now as dimension of h is equal to one, we have this thing pi g v is equal to chi pi g v. Okay, we will have this. This this is true because uh, this is a one dimensional representation. So pi g v is equal to chi pi g v. Now as pi is a group homomorphism from the star above, it follows that chi pi g one g two is equal to chi pi g one into chi pi g two. So chi pi is a really group homomorphism, continuous group homomorphism. Now, since pi is unitary, okay. Since this pi is unitary, from this star, it will also clear that mod of chi pi z is one. Okay, so chi pi is a continuous group homomorphism from G to S one. So thus, chi pi from G to S one is a continuous group homomorphism. Hence, what we get? Hence, we get this chi pi belongs to home G. Okay. okay. So what did you what did you see? We started with a one dimensional unitary representation of G. And you take the character of that representation. That character is really an element of Hom G. Okay. So conversely, let pi belongs to Hom G. Okay. Pi is a continuous group homomorphism from G to S one. We define a representation pi phi on C. Okay. We define a one-dimensional representation pi phi on the complex vector on the complex plane. By pi phi g z is really nothing but pi g z, okay, and z is nothing but c. Now it is easy to take that pi phi is a one-dimensional unitary representation of g. Let us write it unitary representation. So pi phi is a unitary representation of g, and one can check that chi of pi phi is equal to phi. Okay, so character of uh, uh, pi phi is equal to phi. So also observe that if phi and phi and psi belong to G, and phi not equal to psi, then pi phi will not be equivalent to pi psi. If phi phi and psi are different elements of Hom G, then the uh, pi phi will not be really equivalent to pi psi. Otherwise, what will happen? For if if pi phi is equivalent to pi psi, then chi pi phi is equal to chi pi psi. And you know that chi pi phi is equal to phi, and chi pi phi psi is equal to psi. But since we are taking phi is not equal to psi, therefore this cannot. Okay. 
so what i we have done we had we have taken five blocks to common c so we have constructed a representation pi phi one dimensional representation so that chi pi phi is going to be so what essentially it says that this discussion says that if you look at the one dimensional unitary representation of g that is really one to one correspondence with form g okay hence the set of equivalence classes of one dimensional unitary representation of g is one to one correspondence with form g okay so this is the uh, set this is the collection of all equivalence classes so that which has dimension one and that is really it one to one correspondence with form g and what is the map you look to look at the equivalence class of pi and you simply map to the pi 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 now if g is abelian so special guess when g is abelian we know that if g is abelian then any unitary representation is one dimensional hence g hat is nothing but this g hat is equivalence class of pi so that d pi is equal to 1 and the, uh, and this set is collection of uh, this set okay equivalence class of pi so that d pi is equal to 1 that is equivalent uh, that is one to one correspondence from g so thus g hat can be identified with form g i will take little water okay so we have uh, we have shown that g hat uh, can be identified with form g okay for when our g is abelian okay now example if you take g is equal to s1 and s1 is nothing but r mod 2 pi j for n belong to j let en from r to s1 is given by ent is equal to the power int okay clearly this en is a we have seen that also in the beginning clearly en is a 2 pi periodic continuous group homomorphism from r to s1 since in en is 2 pi periodic this hence en can be regarded as a continuous group homomorphism from s1 to s1 So En is a element from home as well. Okay. Now conversely, one can show that any um, element of home as one, okay, can be really uh, is of this form En. Okay. So one can say that home as one is the collection of all En so that N belongs to there, and this is an exercise. So this home as one are really parameterized by uh, the integers. So S one hat is par can be parameterized by J. and one thing is i should tell you this form g is a group there is a natural group structure on form g but probably professor mandi sir has talked has talked those things okay so s1 hat is there now we have we want a uh, notation let b be a vector space over c let m alpha alpha belongs to i be a family of such spaces of p now i use this thing then summation of m alpha alpha log beta to i is by definition is this is equal to span of union of alpha log to i m alpha okay this summation alpha log to i m alpha will be called as vector sum vector space sum of m alpha alpha log to i so i am taking a vector space over c and m alpha alpha belongs to i be a family of subsets of b then i am taking this M alpha summation alpha belongs to alpha i summation of alpha M alpha alpha belongs to i span of this is by definition this is span of M alpha M alpha alpha belongs to this called as a vector space sum of M M alpha so there is something called algebraic direction or Edward uh, space direction we will um, we will discuss that now direct sum of Hilbert spaces let H alpha alpha belongs to i be a family of Hilbert spaces. Then we define this algebraic direct sum of H alpha alpha belongs to I. This is the notation. With the collection of all B alpha alpha belongs to I, belonging to the Cartesian product of H alpha alpha to I, so that B alpha is equal to zero for all directions of alpha. So look at the definition carefully. So this notation, okay. So this is called as really. Uh, algebraic uh, direct sum of h alpha okay so algebraic direct sum of h alpha alpha belongs to i is the collection of all the elements which belonging to the cartesian product of h alpha alpha belongs to i 
so is that except for finite many uh, alpha finite many coordinates this b alpha is equal to g now we if we, this algebraic direct sum is alpha alpha log y with an inner product given by this thing inner product of u alpha alpha log y comma b alpha alpha log y is this is called to summation of alpha log y inner product of u alpha log y since uh, this u alpha is equal to zero except for finite limit component so that for that reason that this uh, this sum actually will exist and this will define an inner product on this algebraic direct sum of h alpha alpha log y now thus uh, algebraic direct sum h alpha alpha log y i becomes an index inner product space okay now i will complete that you know that every hilbert space can be completed so the hilbert space completion of this algebraic direct sum of h alpha alpha log y uh is denoted by this this notation h alpha alpha log y and there is a hat there is mm, hat here okay and this is called as hilbert space direct sum of h alpha alpha log y so hilbert space completion of algebraic direct sum is the hilbert the direct sum of h alpha alpha log y the completion alpha log y uh, hil the completion Uh, Hilbert space direct sum of h alpha alpha log y can be realized as the set of all b alpha alpha log y belonging to the Cartesian product of h alpha alpha log y, so that the summation alpha belongs to y b alpha square is y. Hence, to take this thing, hence this Hilbert space direct sum h alpha alpha log to y is nothing but collection of b alpha alpha log y. Belongs to the Cartesian product of h alpha alpha log y, so that um, summation alpha log y norm of b alpha square is finite. Now inner product on the Hilbert space direct sum of h alpha alpha log y is given by inner product of u alpha alpha log y, comma inner product of comma b alpha alpha log y inner product of, is equal to summation alpha log y u alpha inner product of u alpha and u alpha. So this is a thing. Remember, this notation means algebraic direct sum, and this notation means uh, it is a Hilbert. So one example is if you take i is equal to n and h alpha is equal to c for h in alpha belongs to n, then you will get the algebraic direct sum of h alpha is nothing but c zero zero. And if you take the Hilbert space direct sum of h alpha alpha belongs to n, it is little n to n. So observe that uh, the sum and h alpha. Okay, so let us do this. Okay, observe that the sum and h alpha are embedded in the algebraic direct sum of h alpha. Hence, in this uh, Hilbert space direct sum of h alpha alpha plus two i, as mutual mutually orthogonal. Closed subspace in a canonical way. So each h alpha are, is embedded. Uh, h alpha are embedded in this algebraic sum h alpha alpha plus two. I as usually orthogonal closed subspace in a canonical way. What is the embedding? Is it, this embedding is something like this. Let beta belongs to I. So h beta will sit inside where this thing alpha belongs to I h alpha, and uh, this will sit inside. Itself. Now, if you take an element, say u here, okay, u will go to some element this thing, b alpha, alpha belongs to i, and what will be this element uh, here? So b alpha will be u if alpha is equal to beta, or zero if alpha not equal to beta. So this is the embedding. Okay. okay. Now <clears throat> let Second observation: Let H be Hilbert space, and let H alpha alpha belongs to I be a family of mutually orthogonal closed subspaces of the H. Then it is easy to see that this vector space sum of H alpha alpha belongs to I is isomorphic to the algebraic direct sum of H alpha alpha belongs to I. So if H alpha is a really mutually orthogonal family of closed subspaces, then this vector space says. Sum of h alpha alpha log to i is really isomorphic to the 
Algeria direct sum of H alpha alpha is also right. And how is this vector vector space sum of H alpha alpha zones? Why it is defined? This is by definition, this is span of unit of alpha zones by H alpha. Okay. Now you if you look at this closure of this vector space sum of H alpha, alpha zones, right? this is isomorphic to the Hilbert direct sum of H alpha alpha zones. Right? It is very easy to see because if you take the closure of algebraic direct sum, uh, that becomes uh, the Hilbert space direct sum. And these two things are this thing and this thing and this thing are equivalent. So, in particular, if vector space sum of H alpha 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 is dense in H, then H is isomorphic as Hilbert space, the Hilbert space direct sum of H alpha alpha alpha. In particular, if these things are dense in H, then H is isomorphic to the uh, Hilbert space direct sum of H alpha alpha. alpha. So these are the something. Now I define something called direct sum of requirements. Let pi alpha, comma H alpha, alpha belongs to I be a family of unitary representation of a group. Okay. I define a new recognition. We want to define a new representation pi of G on the Hilbert space H. And what is H? H is the inverse space direct sum of H. So we want to define a representation pi on this space H. So, so pi G, action of pi G on a uh, element V alpha alpha belongs to I. This is a typical element of H. Okay, so will be defined as pi alpha g v alpha alpha alpha. In the alpha coordinate, simply pi alpha g will up because v alpha will also simply h alpha. So it is easy to see that one can check that pi defines an unitary representation okay, on the Hilbert space H. And the representation pi comma h is called direct sum of pi alpha h alpha alpha alpha. And is usually denoted as like this. So this is nothing but direct sum of pi alpha alpha plus pi, and the Hilbert space. You know that Hilbert direct sum of h alpha. alpha. So what I am doing, I am taking pi alpha h alpha, and I am constructing a representation, which is nothing but direct sum of uh, this pi alpha. Okay, and that will act on Hilbert direct sum of this h alpha alpha plus pi, and pi g. Will apply on this V alpha alpha plus pi by some by, by like this pi alpha g v alpha. in the alpha coordinate simply pi alpha g will really up. Now first proposition: any finite dimensional U of g is complete reduction. Probably you have seen you, you, you must have seen this thing in case of finite group representation theory. So it says that any finite dimensional you know, representation of G is complete reduction. So we will prove by induction on dimension of H. If dimension of H is equal to one, nothing to do. If pi is zero to two, then we are done. In this case also, not, not, nothing to do. Otherwise, let W is a pi invariant subspace of H. Okay. So we, in yesterday's lecture, we have proved that W part is also pi invariant. So hence, we will get that H is equal to W plus W part. Now, as dimension of W is less than dimension of H, and dimension of W part is still less than dimension of H, now, by induction hypothesis, W can be really broken into irreducible process, and W part also will be, can be broken into irreducible process. So the result follows by induction. So this is clear. Now, there is a fact that any unitary representation of G not necessarily finite dimensional is complete reduction. If you look at this proposition, this assumes that we are proving basically any finite dimensional representation G is completely reducible, unitary representation. But the thing is, in this fact, say that any unitary representation of G that not, may, not, may not be finite dimensional, that is completely reducible. And for proof, you can see my note or you can see a lamp. Okay. Now, def uh, definition, let pi comma h be a unitary representation of g. Let e pi comma g is the span of pi q comma b, so that u comma b belongs to h. Okay? Clearly, e pi g is a subspace of cg. Okay? So e pi g is nothing but span of microscopy of pi. Clearly, e pi g is a subspace of cg. Okay? Let pi comma h and rho comma k be unitary representation of G, so that pi is equivalent to rho. 
let pi and rho be two unitary representation of g so that pi is equal to rho then e pi g is equal to e rho g okay so let t from h to k two fields two fields something like this let t h to k be with the unitary equivalence let u comma v be the i look at the matrix option rho p u comma t v uh, uh, i evaluated that at the point g so by definition this is a nothing but rho g inner part of rho g t v comma t u but uh, since the t is a g inner depending of rho g t this rho g t is nothing but t pi g so i put there so that this is equal to inner part of t pi g t comma t u and t is a unitary map because the equivalence is unitary equivalence so that is equal to for that reason this inner part of pi g t comma u and this pi u g so hence i am getting rho of t u comma t v is equal to pi u comma u so matrix coefficient of pi is is uh, same as matrix coefficient of rho if pi is an equivalent to rho then matrix coefficient of pi is same as matrix coefficient of rho therefore e pi g i will get is really e rho g remember this okay now let us do a discussion okay let uh, pi comma h pi be a unitary irreducible representation of g okay so let that be in two water Let pi comma x be an irreducible unitary uh, representation of g. We know that dimension of x pi, which is d pi, is finite. Okay. Let s is equal to really e one e two e d pi be a fixed orthonormal basis of x. I am fixing an orthonormal basis of. Okay. I am using the notation pi i comma j g uh, by this pi e i comma e j g. So pi i j comma g is d pi definition pi. E i comma e j one less than equal to pi less than comma j less than equal to d pi. Uh, okay, so recall e pi z is nothing but span of pi d, so that e pi d will be h pi. And since this this s is a basis of h pi, this is equal to span of pi i comma j one less than equal to i comma j. Hence, what I am getting, hence e pi g is a finite dimensional subspace of C. C. Okay. Now, if e pi is finite dimensional subspace of C, Z, and uh, you know the finite dimensional subspaces are always closed, therefore, this e pi g is a closed subspace of C. Z. Okay. So, e pi g is a closed subspace of C. Z. Now, we have in recall in the previous lecture. I have told you that right translate of a matrix coefficient is again matrix coefficient, and left translate of a matrix coefficient is all is again a matrix coefficient. That R G pi of B pi of U comma B is not but pi U comma pi G, and since L G pi of U comma B is nothing but pi pi G U comma B, so that means this E pi G actually. Uh, um, this means that E pi G is a sub representation. Of both right regular representation and left regular representation. Okay, so what I am saying that since if you are to try, the right translate of a matrix coefficient is again a matrix coefficient and left translate of a matrix coefficient is again a matrix coefficient, this space E pi G is, is stable under G uh, right regular action or left regular action. But since E pi G is finite dimensional, it is also a closed process subspace of C G. So that therefore E pi G is sub representation of both right regular and left regular. Now, from source orthogonal to relation, it follows that this set B pi G, B stands for basis, B pi G, which is defined as a root D pi by I comma G, one less than equal to I comma J less than equal to D pi. This forms an orthogonal basis. Of okay. So, what I am saying that if you define this set B pi G, this is nothing but root D pi by I comma J, and this One less than equal to i comma j less than equal to d pi. This forms an orthonormal basis of d pi g, and that will follow from source orthogonality relation. That's clear. 
Now, we fix B belongs to X pi with norm of B is equal to one. Okay. So I am fixing B belongs to X pi with B norm B is equal to one. Now I define U B comma pi G is nothing but this matrix constant pi B comma U so that Q belongs to X pi. So remember this uh, definition E B comma pi G is nothing but the collection of this all matrix function pi B comma U so that u belongs to x pi. This first coordinate is b by u. This is the way to remember this definition. We define Tb. Okay. From a uh, we define Tb from x pi to l to g. This Tb is a map from x pi to l to g. By Tb u is nothing but root b pi pi of b comma u. Okay. So this is same thing as pi of b comma root b pi u and this belongs to that this clearly belongs to e e pi z okay. so and it is clear also that image of tv is nothing but e e pi comma g okay. so image of tv is clearly e b comma pi g so clearly tv is a linear map for source source orthonormality uh, one can check that using source of the one can check that TB is an isometric. Okay. Okay. Now claim now my claim is TB this this linear map TB intertwines between the G action. So TB is a G variant operator between pi and right regular representation. So this is the proof. So if you let look at TB pi G U, by definition, this root B pi pi of B comma pi G U. And pi of b comma pi g u is nothing but r g pi of b comma u. I have told you this thing. So this is really r g is a linear map. So r g root b pi pi of b comma u, then r g t b. Hence t b is a intertwining between pi and the right regular equation. And uh, previously I have given an ex example exercise that if something okay. So let let me recall that example. So if t belongs to something like c pi one comma uh, c pi one comma pi two, okay, that means kernel of p is really pi one invariant, uh, okay, and image of p is really pi two invariant. Image of p is pi two invariant. I have talked about this thing. Image of p is pi two invariant. Moreover, this kernel of this is is a closed subspace of uh, H pi one. Therefore, it is sub-representation. Okay. Okay. Now, now as T B is a G intertwining operator in pi and the uh, right regular representation. Now, and now as pi comma H pi is irreducible in the representation, and kernel of T B is a sub-representation of pi, then kernel of T B is either zero or kernel of T B is equal to H pi. So observe that TBB is nothing but root d pi pi b comma b, okay, and b is a unit factor. In norm of b, since norm of b is one, since norm of b is one, I have told you that pi comma b comma b is not zero. So kernel of TB not equal to h pi. So therefore, kernel of TB is equal to zero. That for TB is one one. So TB is really isomorphic to its image, and what is its image? Its image is really pi. E comma E B pi, comma pi G, and if I I told you that image of T B is uh, really G invariant, so hence image of T B, which is nothing but E B comma pi G, okay, and this E B comma pi G is a really finite dimensional subspace of L two G. Thus E B comma pi G is a sub representation of right regular representation, okay, and which is unitarily equivalent to pi comma G. Okay, so TB is a basically G U intertwining operator between pi s comma pi and E B comma pi G, and that is really uh, unitary map. Okay, so and the, so so conclusion E B comma pi G is a sub representation of right regular representation, which is unitarily equivalent to pi comma H pi, and this happens for every B. Okay, not just for only. Single B. This is happens for every B with non B is equal to one. Now recall this is the definition of 
B, B, comma, pi G. Okay. This is the collection of, of all pi G, comma, G, so that you belong to. Right? So observe that E pi G, okay, is nothing but E, E1, comma, pi G, plus direct sum of E, E2, comma, pi G, plus E, D, pi, comma, pi G. Yeah. So this thing, I'm telling you, you have to see, check this thing. Yeah. It, will, it take little time, okay. So e pi g is nothing but direct sum of e one pi g plus e e two pi g plus direct sum of e e two pi comma pi g. Now each copy e e one, each copy is equivalent to really pi h pi. So okay, so let us read. So this this is equivalent to h pi. So this at each copy, so e e one pi with g is equivalent to h pi. E e to the pi comma g, pi g is equivalent to h pi. So that means e pi g is nothing but b pi copies of pi. G. So e pi g um, decomposes decomposes into b pi copies of h pi. So so e pi n e pi g is direct sum of b pi copies of h pi. Okay. So this is a very important thing. Okay? So hence e pi g is a direct sum of b pi copies of h pi. Hence, we get the following theorem. Actually, what we discussed, I am writing that in a form of theorem. So let pi belong to g hat. Okay. So I should write, uh, I should read that equivalence of class of pi belongs to g hat, but I will always read it like uh, pi belongs to g hat. So what I'm saying, ideally one should read this thing like equivalence of cla class of pi belongs to g hat, but I will uh, read that Pi belongs to G at okay. Let uh, pi belongs to G at let E1 comma E2 E D pi be an orthonormal basis of H pi. Then this set B pi G, which is by definition root B pi pi i comma j pi i j one less than equal to i comma j less than equal to B pi is an orthonormal basis of B pi. G. Moreover, E pi G is a finite dimensional sub representation of the right regular representation, which decomposes into exactly d pi copies of h pi okay this is clear now let uh, pi comma rho be two irreducible in a dependence of g so that pi is not equal equivalent to rho then e pi g is orthogonal to zero this is this is basically full orthogonal to okay? so this theorem we will use that okay now there is a proposition if pi is equal to pi one direct sum of pi two there are some up to pi n, then e pi z is nothing but vector space sum of e pi i z summation i is equal to one. Okay. Okay. If pi is equal to pi, pi one uh, plus pi two plus pi n, then e pi z is nothing but vector space sum of e pi i z, and this sum need not be direct because if suppose it happens, it may happen that pi one may equivalent to pi two, and in that sense. E pi one, you will get this e pi two g. E pi one g, is, you will get that e pi two g. So, and the sum may not is not direct. So, because you understand that the sum is uh, not direct. Okay, the notation F D stands for finite dimensional thing. Let E g, okay. So E g is the collection of Vector space sum of e pi g, okay, where pi runs through all irreducible unitary points. So e g is the vector space sum of e pi g, where pi runs through irreducible unitary representation. And by definition, this is nothing but span of union of uh, irreducible unitary uh, span of union of e pi g, where pi runs through runs through e irreducible all the reducible and the representation. Okay. Now, uh, as every finite dimensional representation of G is completely reducible by previous proposition, by this proposition. Okay. So, by this uh, previous proposition, by this proposition, uh, it follows that E G is also vector space of sum of E pi G, so that pi is finite dimensional. Okay. So. Remember, the, here actually I am taking pi is irreducible in representation. 
and mm-hmm. here i am taking pi is an dimensional representation these are these are same because every pi dimensional representation is complete reduction and this is the definition this is called span of union pi union of pi pi dimensional okay now for pi belongs to g hat let b pi c is nothing but square root of d pi pi i comma g one less than equal to i comma j less than equal to d pi so b stands for basis okay so b pi c is the set uh, collection of all root d pi pi i j so that one less than equal to i comma j less than equal to d pi that b g okay b g is the uh, union of b pi g pi belongs to g r okay as i said it looks like this so b g is nothing but root d pi pi i j so that I belongs to G hat one less than equal to I comma J less than equal to B. Okay, so we we know that this B G is an orthonormal space, okay, okay. by such orthogonality, and this B G is really spans B G, and hence this B G is an orthonormal basis of the inner product space B G. Okay, so what is B G? B G is this this set root D pi pi I J. This is the basis. Okay, now now let S one is equal to R mod two pi j, and R mod two pi j is nothing but uh, close interval zero comma two pi with modulo two pi, and um, uh, and the group operation is addition. Now we know that S one hat is nothing but the collection of all pi n, so that n belongs to J. I have discussed this that S one hat is can be parameterized by J. And the each representation is uh, is a representation on C, and how is the representation is defined? Pi n t on J, pi n t acts on J, where J is an element of C is nothing e to the power i n t into J. So recall that e n from R to C be given by e n t is into e to the power i n t. So in this case, I will get what B s one is really n belongs to J. And E S one is nothing but set of all trigonometric polynomials. So in this case, I will get this B S one, the collection of E N, so that N belongs to J, and E S one is the set of all trigonometric polynomials. Okay. Now, okay. So we have developed with some some. Fair amount of representation. Now, our what was our goal? Our goal is to develop uh, uh, the notion of Cauchy and a compact topological group. Okay. Now, um, so what is what is the what is Fourier series in case of S one the group S one? That says that any square root integral function on S one can be written as uh, uh, can be written as really uh, linear combination of this elements of this E. So this is the Fourier series basically. So uh, that is equivalent to this fact that E n n belongs to J is really a orthonormal basis of L to S one. So now for the general group case, so our goal is to define uh, means uh, the notion of Fourier series uh, in on G. So that that problem is equivalent to really. Finding an orthonormal basis for this L two, okay. okay. And uh, in case of, okay, so our goal is to define notion of Fourier series on G, which is equivalent to getting an orthonormal basis of L two. Now, for the case uh, of S one, this B S one forms a really orthonormal uh, basis of this L S one. So, looking at this example, okay, by analogy, you you can, we guess that. Probably B Z will be uh, will form an orthonormal basis of L two Z. So what I am saying that for the case S one, observe that B S one E N N belongs to J is an orthonormal basis of L two S one. Hence, by analogy, our intuition says perhaps that B Z will form an orthonormal basis of for L two Z. Indeed, we will show that B Z will form an orthonormal basis of L two Z. So we, our goal is to show that B Z will form an orthonormal basis. Now, what is the meaning of that BG forms an orthonormal basis of L two G? That means that span of BG is dense in L two G. BG is already always 
this is already orthonormal set okay so observe that bg forms an orthonormal basis for l2g the, which is equivalent to showing that span of bg that is means eg is dense in l2g so if we can show that eg is dense in l2g then we are done okay now uh, hence it suffices to show that uh, eg is dense in l2g okay now now let us look at the example s1 for the case s1 what is es1 es1 is nothing but trigonometric polynomial in s1 right so set of all trigonometric polynomial right? so in your how it is done for the case of s1 for the case of s1 es1 is dense in L, in l2 s1 is uh, shown by using something called stoner's test theorem okay we call that for the group g is equal to s1 the fact that es1 is the set of all trigonometric polynomial is dense in l2 s1 is shown by applying stoner's test theorem precisely one shows that uh, es1 is a self adjoint subalgebra of continuous function which contains constant function and separate points okay uh, so one shows that es1 is a self adjoint subalgebra of continuous function which contains constant function 1 and separate points now hence by applying stone wester's theorem one shows that es1 is dense in cs1 in the uniform norm one shows that es1 is dense in cs1 in the supremum norm now since the supremum norm is bigger than l2 norm this one gets that es1 is dense in cs1 in l2 norm now as cs1 is dense in l2 s1 in the l2 norm so one so that es1 is dense in l2 s1 in l2 norm okay. this is how it is done in the case of the circle group okay now for any arbitrary compact household topological group d we will follow exactly the same idea as of s1 Hence, our goal is to show that EG is a self adjoint subalgebra of CG. Second thing we have to show that EG contains constant function one. Third thing is EG separate points. Okay. 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 So I hope my goal is really uh, clear to all of you. Okay. Okay. Now, what you do? Okay, we will pick up one by one. So first, we will show that EG is a special adjoint subalgebra of ECG, and for that reason, we have to define something called tensor product representation. Tensor product: let pi comma h and rho comma k be two finite dimensional unitary representation of G. So we define this vector space as tensor k. This is nothing but part of U tensor B, so that U belongs to H and B belongs to K. You understand this? Thing. On H tensor K, we equip an inner product as follows. First, we define for simple tensor element. For first, we define inner product of two simple tensor. So, inner product of X tensor Y comma U tensor B is nothing but inner product of X and U and inner product of Y and comma B. This X and uh, uh, U, this X and U belongs to really H and u comma b belongs to k so this is the inner product in h and this is the inner product in k now using this star above and by just linearity we extend it to h tensor k okay so on h tensor k we have an inner product okay now for u belongs to h and b belongs to k we define a, a linear operator pi uh, okay so we define some linear for the pi tensor rho g okay okay we, we define first on the simple tensor so we define pi tensor rho g on u tensor b is nothing but pi g u tensor rho g okay okay for on simple tensor we define the linear map, we define a map pi tensor rho g which will act on u tensor b is by pi g u tensor pi rho g by linearity, we extend the action of pi tensor rho to really h tensor k. Okay, so one can check that this pi tensor rho uh, defines a finite dimension on a unitary representation, which is nothing but I write like this: pi tensor rho comma h tensor k of g. And if you look at the matrix coefficient of pi tensor rho uh, at this coordinate, u tensor b comma x tensor y g. This is nothing but pi uxg into rho qy. Okay. 
thus i will look what this thus thus i get this of uh, this matrix function pi tensor rho u tensor b comma x tensor tensor y is nothing but pi u x into rho comma y as a function so what i am getting product of two matrix function is again in a matrix function so product of uh, pi uh, matrix function of pi and product of matrix function into product of a matrix function of rho is nothing but matrix function of pi tensor rho then star and then star shows that the product of matrix function of a two finite dimensional unitary representation is again a matrix function of finite dimensional unitary so observe that this shows that easy is a algebra now as easy is equal to span of union of pi pi finite dimensional e pi z okay so this shows that e g is a sub algebra okay so first thing is clear now i want to show that uh, e g is self adjoint for that we have to define something called contra gradient representation so let pi comma x be a finite dimensional unitary representation of g okay now let s is equal to e1 e2 e d pi be a fixed cost normal basis of x okay so this is a thing now as pi is a representation so pi is a map from g to real unit u x pi right u x pi but if i will really in particular this pi is a linear operator on x pi so what i will do so i will look at the matrix representation of pi g with respect to x okay if i will do that so i will get a continuous homomorphism from g to So you define just by fixing the basis okay? and looking at the matrix representation. Okay, by considering a matrix representation with respect to the basis S, we get a continuous group homomorphism pi from G to U D pi. So I am denoting that by pi also. So we define a new representation pi C. We define a new map pi C from G to U D pi by pi C G is equal to really pi G bar. Okay. Pi C G I define by pi G bar. Okay, bar is the com um, complex bar. Okay, so it is easy to check that this pi C is a continuous group of homomorphism. Some okay, and therefore it defines a representation. Hence, pi C defines a finite dimensional unitary representation of T, and pi C is called the uh, as the contra gradient representation of. Okay, okay, observe that. Pi i j c is nothing but pi i j bar. Okay, by definition, because I am, I have simply taken this uh, pi c is defined by simply taking the bar of pi. So this is a uh, the thing. Hence, one gets that matrix coefficient of pi c are precisely complex conjugate of matrix coefficient of pi. Okay. So. Okay. So. So this, if pi is finite dimensional, pi c is finite dimensional. So that means E G is a self-adjoint subalgebra of C. Okay. Now this, uh, now I want to show that uh, E G contains a constant function one. Now for that, really consider the trivial representation pi of C and C. If you look at this pi one comma one G, this is nothing but inner product pi G one comma one, and this is inner product between one and one. This is one. So Then pi one comma one is the constant function one. Thus, E G contains the constant function one. So this is clear. Now I want to show that uh, okay, E G really uh, contains uh, E G really separates the pi. Okay. For that reason, actually we have to really prove. It. So there is a theorem which is due to Galvin and Rykov. So we say that uh, let G be a compact host topological group so that. Uh, This uh, order of G is greater than one. That is, G contains more than one point. Suppose x comma y belongs to G with x not equal to y. Okay. So that the Galvin Dyckhoff theorem says that there exists a unitary irreducible representation of pi, so that pi x is not equal to pi. Okay? So let me read the statement once more. It says that if G is a compact host of a topological group G, then so that uh, G has G contains more than one point. If suppose x comma y belongs to G with x not equal to y, then there exists a unitary irreducible representation pi so that pi x is not equal to pi y. Remark this this theorem precisely says that 
G has sufficiently many representation to really separate the points of G. Okay. So remark, previous theorem says that the group G has sufficiently many Eudo subordinate representations to separate its points. Okay. Now we want to prove that easy separates points. That means there will be a there will exist a matrix of which really separate will separate points. Let uh, cardinality of G is greater than two and x comma y belong to G if x is not equal to y. Okay. I am this in this line. So by Galvanic of theorem, there is a Eudo subordinate representation pi x comma x pi of G with pi x not equal to pi y. So as pi x not equal to pi y, there exists a u belongs to x pi with pi x u is not equal to pi x pi y u. Because since pi x not equal to pi y, so as pi x u is not equal to pi y u, so there exists some b belongs to x pi, so that inner part of pi x u comma b is not equal to inner part of pi u y u comma b. That say that this implies pi b u x is not equal to pi b u y. Hence, pi b comma u separates x and y. So, e g separates points of g. So, I am getting what? Yeah, thus, e g is a self argument so the CG, which contains constant function y and separates points of g. Okay. So, thus, by Stone Western's theorem, what I am getting, e g is dense in CG in the supreme knot. RG is compact and is triple measure of one. So, that means e g is dense. In L C G in L two naught, okay. So E G is dense in C G in the supremum number. The, from that I am getting that E G is dense in C G in L two naught because L two naught is smaller than uh, the supremum number. Since C G is dense in L two G in the L two naught, therefore E G is dense in L two G in L two naught. So what I am getting, I am consequently I am getting B G root of square root of D pi pi i j. This is pi belongs to G hat one less than equal to i. So my j less than equal to b pi, this forms an orthonormal basis for L to g. Okay. So this is the thing. So what I am getting is I am getting is this okay, L to G. This is nothing but uh summation vector stress sum of uh, e pi g pi belong to g at closure. Okay, so this sorry. Okay, so Recall that this thing is e pi z pi belongs to g hat. So this is nothing but your easy, right? E g closure is L to G way epsilon. So I am writing this thing. And since this e pi, if pi is not equivalent to rho, then e pi is really orthogonal to rho. So I can write that thing is like this. So this can be write like written like this. Now each e pi g, I have told you that each e pi g decks into d pi copies of it. So I am writing this h pi plus h pi plus h pi d pi copies. So this is just a notation, pi belongs to g hat and this is the notation whatever you want. So since, okay, I have written this, since e pi g under right regular representation decomposes to d pi copies of h pi, okay, we conclude that L to G on the right regular representation decomposes into an orthogonal dire sum of all irreducible unitary representation in which each irreducible unitary representation occurs exactly each degree. Okay. So look at the statement once more. So what I am saying that E pi G will break into uh, irreducible pieces and every irreducible representation will occur inside L to G. Okay. Under right, uh, under right reg regular representation, and each copy will suppose pi h pi is an irreducible representation, then h pi will occur d pi. So since e pi g under right regular representation decomposes to d pi copies of h pi, we conclude that L two g under right regular representation decomposes into an orthogonal direct sum of all irreducible unitary representation, in which each irreducible unitary representation occurs in that limit degree time as the right regular representation r l to g is also equivalent to the left regular representation l to l to g so same is true for left regular uh, because left regular representation is equivalent to right so now this is the final theorem 
So this is the theorem. Friends, we get the following. So P12 theorem is say that Vg is nothing but root d pi pi i comma j. So that pi plus g hat one less than equal to i comma j less than equal to g pi forms an orthonormal basis of L to g. And this thing, L comma L to g uh, is equal to R comma L to g. So this is L stands for left to the world. And this belongs to pi belongs to g hat pi and this is e pi g is this is this is the b pi com copies of pi comma h pi. so this is the statement okay now once uh, you get this thing uh, an orthonormal basis of l to g so you can prove like hilbert space theory you can prove something called part uh, plancheral theorem etc you can develop for your analysis on this uh, so compact uh, group okay so there is also a plancheral theorem which can be written in a compact form and there are actually those two non-harmonic analysis which really uh, uh, means uh, in two non-harmonic analysts actually see the subject after the harmonic analysis is for them after harmonic analysis is develop representation theory and two plants are there. okay and uh, but to the person who are really working harmonic analysis they understand that for that only you have to you develop analysis okay so with this i would like to stop and i will be happy to have any question if uh, there if there is any question from the audiences so thank you dr muna naik are there any questions comments uh, suggestions It is indeed a right place to stop. And uh, the next speaker would be starting from this point, perhaps. Next speaker will start from this, only, uh... sir. <laughs> Hello? I just want, I don't want to reveal the secret. But <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, this is the place from where I would be beginning. But after a long gap, I would recall some of the things which. Uh, Dr. Munanaik explained in my own way, and then we will do something on compact reports. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, let us all thank Dr. Munanaik for a beautiful down to earth uh, lecture with so much details, nitty gritty details. Thank you, Dr. Munanaik. Thank you, Munanaik, and thanks, Professor Murganandam, for coming to chair this. And see you next month in yes. person in Pune. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, we will close this now. Yeah. Right. Thank you.